The problem is with all the stimulus money that was put into the economy, they have what is called the overnight repo. What's going on, Real Deals podcast listeners? I think I got a good show for you this week. I'm going to talk about a lot of my personal struggles and some things in this business that continue to always be a challenge. And I think if you're newer in this business or you've been in this business a long time, you can relate to this or you can also maybe learn from some of these hurdles. So but I'm also going to talk about some of the good things that we have going and kind of what we're focusing on and I'm focusing on my business right now. The one thing I really want out of this show and for people listening is maybe you hear something that I'm doing and maybe you reach out to me and say, hey, I've dealt with this before or you can follow along and kind of maybe see what how we're doing this and then you can grow as well. So let's get into a little bit about what's going on with us this week. So tomorrow we have our appraisal on our 32 unit um, apartment complex. Pretty excited about that. I don't want to talk about all the financing things we've done so far, but once this deal closes, I really want to talk about how we structured this. I think you're really going to like it. It's, it's going to be pretty cool. So I'm actually very surprised and impressed with what we've done and I didn't know it was possible, but really excited to really dive in and break down the numbers and have you guys follow along on that process. So we have a wholesale deal closing this week. It's going to be like a $16,000, $17,000 wholesale fee. And so that's pretty exciting. That one's in Tri-Cities. We have uh, another deal that I tied up last week that was cool. I've never had this happen before. I had a, a gentleman walk in with a letter in hand to our office, went and talked to my assistant. She then called me. I was on the phone, but she said, hey, some guy's here wants to sell his mom's house. I looked at the house. He said he wanted 140 for it. And there was a picture uh, she had it pulled up online. I'm like, I think, you know, that looks like a possibly a deal. Went and walked it. Now, a lot of people would try to tie it up right there and negotiate around the spot. But I really was very trying to be very patient. I knew he was in town for a short time, so I didn't have a ton of time to really think about it. But I wanted him to kind of put some thoughts in his head about, you know, maybe he wouldn't get his full price. Went back, ended up tying up for 133.5, called my lender. He's going to give me 135,000 at 8%. And so we're going to close on that tomorrow or Monday. So we're waiting with uh, some title issues. So pretty cool deal. We're going to have that be a filler project. It'll just sit there. Worst case, it's a great rental. And uh, yeah, it should be maybe 40K worth of work, but excited about that project. So that's kind of stuff that we've had going on this week. The other thing we had is we hired an executive assistant that worked for us, mainly for my wife in the property management side, but she also started doing some stuff for me as well. She got a really good job offer from a company her mom worked at to take over her mom's old job, and we just could not match it. And so she put her notice in, which was pretty disappointing because we really liked her a lot. She was a good fit for our culture. She had a whatever it took attitude. She she just was really good. So we wish her all the best. But then this week we've been in scramble mode because we're buying this 32 unit. We have 66 doors under management still. My wife doesn't want to manage everything. So we're hiring. Actually, we decided to hire two positions. So we are hiring a full property manager. We have like five interviews lined up tomorrow, but we're hiring somebody with property management experience because we're going to be very close to 100 units um, here shortly. And now, again, we don't own all those units, but we manage them. 24 units we own with as a quarter. Eight units we own as a third. We own another 25 unit, 50-50, and the 32 unit we're going to own 50-50. And then we have our singles and doubles that we own ourselves. So, But we manage everything ourselves in-house. So we'll hire somebody with some experience, so hopefully we can get a good candidate there. But I am also hiring an executive assistant directly to work for me. So I have in a couple of the businesses I have, I have right-hand guys that work for me and with, with me. So I have Tony, who you guys heard last week on the show. He is my sales manager, my right-hand guy, he handles all our sales, basically. I'll go on some appointments here and there, but Tony basically handles all the leads, the lead follow-up, the CRM management, all those things. And then I have Spencer in the call center, who basically I'll do client calls and then Spencer handles basically everything from there. I will do some of the stuff myself, but basically I uh, have Spencer do most of that. So the issue is I'm still missing a ton of things and there's still a lot of things that need to get done and it's just too much for 
not maybe too much work for one person, but it's too many thought processes for one person. So I'm going to hire that. So I just posted that job today. I got mine done a little bit later than Chrissy, but we are going to jump in and have two people. So we'll talk about that a little bit in the show. So anyway, here's a quick word from our sponsor and we'll jump right into it. Okay. So we are going to talk something about partnerships and just running this business and running this business with a longevity mindset. So how can I be successful for the next 10 years, not just the next 10 months? So I have five partnerships basically that we have. So we have the call center and I have Tucker as a part of that. And we have Cole. We have our flipping business that I have a partnership with my partner that I've talked about quite a bit in Vancouver. We have our development and building multifamily partnership with a local developer here, builder here in Trey Cities. I have my partnership with some buddies from Seattle on the 124 unit. I have now a business partnership with my buddy that's out of Seattle as well that we're buying the 32 unit and we bought the 25 unit with and we want to buy 500 units in the next 18 months. And then we actually just created another partnership last week for a media company. We're calling it New New Media. A lot of, if you follow me on Instagram, a lot of my posts and content has been written down, written by an intern. I shoot the videos and do these things, but he puts all the captions, does all the planning for that, make sure they get posted. And so he's a really, really smart guy. He's a college professor, great writer. He can build courses. He can do a lot of different things. So we want to give him some upside and we, so we're going to create a partnership with him. So that's actually six. And then I have a small partnership on the eight unit with my cousin and another guy, but that's pretty simple. But managing those partnerships is really hard, but really, really rewarding. This business is, you can look at this business in two different ways. If you've listened to Tucker for a while, you know that he generally did not like partnerships. He did all his house buying stuff himself. He did his fix and, you know, all his new build stuff himself. He had team people that worked on the team, but he did most of it himself and didn't have partnerships. He always said partnerships end badly normally. And I would say that I agree with him on some level of that. The, the difference is Tucker is a very unique individual. Tucker is, and I've talked about this a lot. He is that optimal CEO that can also blend to a sales guy that can also blend in, into a CFO accountant. He's just can be a uh, marketing officer. He can do all these things. He is very, very talented. And so I think with somebody like him that is disciplined and can put procedures in place and put all these things in place and put the right people in the right seats, you can do this and grow a big business by yourself. Same with, I have uh, my buddy, Greg, that has been on the show before. He does the same thing. He doesn't have any partners in his uh, home construction business, but now we've happened to partner on our multifamily stuff. But he didn't need anybody or nor did he want anybody in his construction business. He is very similar to Tucker in that way. Where partnerships, I found that they work really well for me is I am highly specialized and good at a few things. These guys are really good at a lot of things. I'm very good at a few things. So I'm really good at sales. I'm very good at putting deals together and I'm very good at finding good operators. and I'm very good at raising money, but I am highly unorganized. I have 10,000 ideas a day and I just need somebody to guide me and point me in the right direction. Now my wife has done that for years, but there is a level of, you know, other partners that I think can do it a little bit differently. Not that one's better or one wor one's worse, but I think I need to spread my wings. So, I, what I've done is I need to spread myself out and minimize not so much risk, but put myself in different situations where I can be highly specialized. And we talked about this in the show where like the, being the dentist in your business. And so, and it was a surgeon. And so I can be highly specialized where partnerships, and I don't, I don't want to dive into that because we talked about that in the show before, but where partnerships get challenging is assigning value to what you bring and also making sure that you always are looking out for the partner that you have on that deal. So I have a challenge right now. We have the 24 unit that we have with uh, partners. It's the only, we're only partners in this deal and we are selling it. I put a deal together that is just an amazing deal and 
we're all going to be very happy about it. But we have to go find another building to 1031 into. So nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing. However, I have a partner that I have said I'm going to buy 500 units of multifamily with in the next 18 month, months. And we have a marketing campaigns going and a full sales funnel going for deals in the same areas. And so how do you how do you make sure in that situation that if I go find a deal to 1031 money to that I am not screwing or taking away from my partner that I have said that I'm buying straight multifamily with. And, and it's really good that I work with really good, easygoing people, but you always have to keep that because resentments start out really small and resentments. Once they get into your business, they start to fester and they, they grow into bigger things. And so you have to be very careful. So how I've handled that so far is I have been very upfront with the both partners of what we're doing. And I have offered to, I could, if I buy and go find a deal for my company, we can clip assignment fee on this. So we'll be able to take a fee. So I have told my partner that first off, I will run the deal by him first and let him know, Hey, this is kind of needs to go in this bucket. And if I get an assignment fee, I will probably, I will give him half of that assignment fee. And so That is what in my mind, especially if it comes off of any efforts of marketing that we have done that needs, but it still kind of needs to go in this bucket. So I would pay him out on that deal, whether he did anything or not, because he did a lot on the front end, right? Because he helped with the marketing or whatever. So really having those conversations and being very upfront and understanding that you need to pay money and make sure that people understand that you are not selfish and it's not all about you. And that's the fine line because you might think you're doing the right thing in these partnerships, but it, it might not be the right thing. And so it's, it's a real challenge and it's hard for somebody like me because I'm a people pleaser is I want to make people happy all the time. And so I got to be very careful with overlap. And so that's kind of what I've been doing on that on that kind of, on that front. And and it just, you know, or say I get a deal with this one partner and it's a development deal. It's a land deal to build apartments. Well, I'm doing apartments with one guy, but do I have to bring the builder developer that I have partnerships with building other multifamily in on that? And, And that's where it gets really challenging. And so I had a conversation with one of my partners the other day and we were driving around and talking and he had mentioned that because we, we're, we're going to do a commercial deal together. And my, the guy I was doing it with or talking with, he wanted to maybe look at doing another builder other than my partner that we had already talked about this with. And he made a comment. He said, if, if that's better for the deal, go for it. Like, I'm not tied to this. There'll be more deals. And so he was just excited that I, that I won. And so, you know, instead of, he could have said, well, I start telling him about this deal or whatever. And he's, instead of saying, oh, I'm happy for you to say, oh, why didn't you bring me in? That's their first thought process is them, 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 right? And so you really have to find that and look at that in partners to make sure that they want you to win just as much as you want them to win. And if you can always do those things, I think everything works out really, really, really good in this business. And so there's just so much opportunity. You can't do all these things yourself. And there is somebody out there that can do stuff way better than you on the things that you're not very good at. And there's people, those people are usually looking for the things that you're really, really good at. So I would implore you to, if, if you're starting this business, finding somebody that can help you and that you could partner with on deals that you both bring value to the table. And I think that there is so much more that can be accomplished. And I I think it's so much more enjoyable and fun to win together as well. So that's the one thing that I really like is the camaraderie and the friendship and just the shooting the shit and everybody's laughing when you're winning. But you also got to make sure that the partners you have when shit goes south, because some point shit's going to go south. I mean, we don't know when, but shit's going to go south. And I think you need to know who you have in your in your camp and make sure that they're going to sit there and ride that boat with you, no matter if it's good or it's or it's bad. So. Switching gears here, there has been a lot of things in the 
out in the markets, out in the headlines about real estate, real estate crashing, interest rates going up a little bit, or the Fed's going to raise interest rates here in the next um, and start stop start tapering bond buying. And so, what are we looking at in this sense? So, I'm not an economist by any means, but I try to follow along as much as I can. And politics aside, right now it's September 30th. And we are still at a stalemate in the House for the $1 trillion infrastructure bill and the $3.5 trillion reconciliation bill. And there's a lot of different things in those bills that, you know, if it gets done, they want to raise taxes, they want to change things. So, but they just can't seem to get it done. So there's a lot of fighting within parties and, and across party lines and getting stuff done. So that's, that's a hard part because we don't know a direction and markets hate uncertainty. So... Jerome Powell came out last week and and Jerome Powell is the chairman of the Federal Reserve and he made a comment about, they were talking about the Fed tapering, interest rates are, or not interest rates, the inflation rate is still high. He made a comment, I think today, saying that inflation does worry him. He sees it going through the end of the year. We also have supply chain issues, but we have to start tapering bond buying and asset purchases because that's the only thing that's going to slow inflation to a certain extent. So what does that mean for us? So currently the Fed is buying $40 billion a month, roughly, of mortgage-backed securities. So if you go back to, if you go back to March, 2020, we were looking at loans at that point. This is right during COVID. Mortgage rates, usually you can call your broker and say, hey, what are rates doing today? And they can lock you in, you know, they can basically do the same rate that they talk to you about in the morning and they can lock, lock it. And then you could call them back in the afternoon and, and whatever. There's not a ton of movement in the rates. Well, rates were jumping everywhere. They were jumping 50, 60 basis points. It seemed like, you know, within hours and, and basis points is like point. So 50 basis points would be uh, half a percent. So each basis point is 0.1%. And so that's how they talk in those terms. So right now, you know, the, the 10 year treasury is at one, 150 basis points is what it is, one and a half percent. And so, so when the Fed, the Fed stepped in and started buying mortgage-backed securities to calm the market. So that leveled the market, made way for historic, historic interest rates. Because without the Fed buying them, no investors want to buy interest rates at this extremely low return on their money when they're not even keeping up with inflation, which would basically give them a negative return on their money. And that's when they're talking about negative interest rates. That's basically what it is. It's negative interest rates. If you're buying, you know, if you're buying these 10 year treasuries, if it you're buying at a one and a half percent rate of return every year and inflation stays at 4%, you're technically losing two and a half percent to inflation every single year um, or buying power at that point. So the Fed stepped in and started buying mortgage backed securities to calm the market. Well, that's been going on for a while. The Fed's at seven, eight trillion dollars of money that they spent, you know, that they've had and they're, they call it their quantitative easing. And so Jerome Powell made a comment that they're going to start tapering their buying program in November. So they've been buying $40 billion a month of mortgage backed securities and roughly $80 billion a month of junk bonds, assets, stocks, things like that. So that's injecting liquidity into the market. So the problem is with all the stimulus money that was put into the economy, they have what is called the overnight repo. And the overnight repo traditionally was used for banks that needed cash because they, they had to have cash requirements so that they, they needed cash overnight. And it's a short-term lending. It was like one or two day stuff, so they, but they get it overnight. And they would, they would have treasury bonds that they have in their, in their asset pool. And they would give the treasury bonds to the, the banks. And then they would take, um, they would borrow money and there would be an overnight repo rate. Usually it wasn't a ton, but when you start talking about huge numbers, it actually gets expensive. Well, what happened recently is we have now what's called a reverse repo. The banks are sitting on so much cash that they can't lend out that it's actually a liability on their books and they actually can't have this much cash. So, and as it was a liability because they're not lending it out, so they're losing money. So they're doing what's called a reverse repo. So now instead of giving the tre giving the Fed treasury bonds and taking cash, now what they're doing is they're giving the Fed 
cash and taking treasury bonds and getting, you know, one or two basis points, something really small, but when you're giving them a trillion and a half dollars, I mean, it adds up really quick. So the Fed's having to pay basically interest on the money it's lending or they're, they're, they're borrowing back, right? So we're at a trillion and a half, I think, dollars on that. And they just made an announcement. There was a limit that you could only put in 80 billion dollars as a bank on the overnight repo. They think they just jumped that up to 160 billion or something crazy like that. But that means there's some big boys sitting on a lot of cash because the federal government put so much cash into the economy through all their stimulus packages that there's just so much money sitting out into the market right now. But the banks don't want to lend it out because interest rates are so low and they're being they're concerned about locking in these short, you know, these long term debt on on interest rate on these low interest rates. And so they have to do it. They do it this way instead so they can wait for better opportunities because they're not getting yield anywhere, right? Everybody's looking for a return on their money. So it's gonna be very interesting. Once the Fed stops buying mortgage-backed securities and they raise rates, which they have their what's called their Fed funds rate. So everybody says, oh, the Fed's gonna raise the interest rates and that's gonna increase mortgage mortgages by 25 basis points. So say they do a 25.25% rate increase, everybody thinks that's gonna raise mortgage interest rates. That's not true. Mortgage interest, uh, mortgage rates are still controlled by supply and demand. So if they somebody buys these these all these mortgages and they try to sell them for on the open market to a company, well, it's a supply and demand. If people don't want to buy them at the interest rates, they have to offer more interest, and so then they have to start charging more for the mortgages. And so, when the Fed stops buying, that takes forty billion dollars out of the mo- the market every month buying mortgage backed securities which then is going to say, now the investors that have been sitting on the sideline are gonna want a higher rate of return. So it will increase rates. Plus the Fed, what the Fed funds rate does to come into here is that allows, that increases the treasury rates. So then it automatically has to push up other rates because if I can say, I can go borrow, I can go loan a million dollars to the federal government at one and a half percent, or I can go buy mortgages and I can get, 1.6%, 1.6%, well, what are you gonna do? You're gonna probably buy treasury bonds because they're safe. They're backed by the US government. So take that for what it is, but they're backed by the US government. The mortgage rate, the mortgage, mortgages can have defaults, they can have issues, they can be servicing issues or whatever. There's more risk involved, so they need to make a higher return. So now all of a sudden, let's say the Fed fund rate goes from one point, you know, five percent, which it's not, but let's say the 10 year treasury goes from one point five percent to one point seven five percent. Well, what do you think that's going to do to mortgage rates? Well, if they before they were Fed was buying mortgages at 1.6%, well, and it just jumped up to 1. Point, you know, now they're at 25 basis points, now it's going to be 1.85%. Well, maybe it's going to actually be more because the now investors want to buy these and not the Fed, so now it's going to be 2% or 2 and a quarter percent or whatever. So it's in going to increase mortgage rates. So it's going to increase the it's going to decrease the affordability in the housing market. So that is something to look for. The last time the Fed was raising, getting off their quantitative easing, and they topped out at 225 basis points, I think in October, September of 2018. Actually, no, I think it was earlier in 2018. The market for mortgages was in the five to five and a half percent range. And the market shit the bed. Poorly. And Seattle lost sixty thousand dollars in median home value over, you know, in like a six month span. So this is when Trump, you know, was in office and they they basically said, Hey, we need to lower this. So they went back and had they're forced to lower the Fed funds rate again because the market the economy was falling apart. So we have created this economy that is a fake economy throughout time. It's you know, from Bush to Clinton to Bush to all these guys, everybody screwed it up in a, in a certain sense. And we were been robbing Peter to pay Paul for, for many years. And so now the Fed either has to do one thing, they have to say, we need to let this reset and just let the market do what the market's gonna do and crash, or we can keep buying these things and keep dumping liquidity and eroding the value of our dollar. And that seems to be what, what it is. So where I think this is still good for real estate, we have an affordable, we have a housing shortage in this country. The last thing I saw, we were short 5 million single family housing units um, across the United States. 
we cannot build fast enough. We have supply chain shortages. We have lumber shortages and price increases. We have worker shortages. We have land shortages because there are shortages in the permitting office, in the county county planning office and all these things. So you can't get properties through to actually go build them. So anything right now that you own is going up in value because it's harder to replace that building. And so when I'm looking at this real estate, you might look at some of these things and say, oh man, it's not that great of a deal. But if you're looking to buy for the long term, you have to ask yourself this one question. Can I replace the building for less or the same amount of money? If the answer is yes, then don't buy it. But for example, when we bought the 25 unit, it, I was talking to one of our buddies that we asked to get in the deal, but he didn't want to. Thank God. We're so happy he didn't because now I own 50% of this deal. That's a great deal. But I said, we were buying it for 2.1. And I said, Jared, what can we replace this for? And it was probably $3 million. So you're buying it $900,000 below replacement cost. So even if you have to put money into it, you're still buying it well below replacement cost. Yes, it's not brand new, but it's still built in the seventies. It's sound, it's got all the lumber already. That stuff's not going old, it's fine. So if you're buying things well below replacement cost, there is implied equity and upside in that because it's harder to build and it's taking longer to build and there is an extreme shortage in supply and demand. Now I say that on rental housing because people still need a place to live. Rents are going through the roof right now because there's, it's really hard for people to find rentals. So where this can get more challenging is if, if you have the market and the mortgages rates increase and you're playing in the mid step up house level to the high end house level, that's going to decrease the affordability and it's going to decrease your buyer pool. And so I wouldn't, necessarily want to be in that unless I'm in a very specialized market like Tucker is in like Oswego or Greg is in Kirkland or Tucker going to go to Naples and do that. But if you're just in that medium to luxury, you're going to limit your buyers if interest rates start going up. Because if you play with mortgage interest rate calculators, you know, 50 basis points or half a percent in interest rates changes things a lot. I mean, even if it's only two, three, four, five hundred dollars $500, you know, a month, that's a big deal when 60% of people don't have a thousand dollars in savings because most people are living paycheck to paycheck. So $500 is a big deal. And I know I struggle with that a lot because I've lost sight of reality in some, some sense of the word. So to me, that's not a big deal, but for most people that is a big deal. So I wanna be in assets that are gonna be very safe, that are needed. I'm buying below replacement costs. So entry level housing, entry level apartments. I don't want to be in luxury apartments. I don't need to be in those or middle level um, apartments. Or can I build these things where I actually come in at a great price because I have partnered with a builder that can get us into the building at cost. So we're not paying the 10, 15, 20% markup that contractors charge. And so we are already have built in um, implied equity into that and how I've gotten the equity is I have partnered with somebody that can build it at cost and they're earning their equity by building that property. So I think those are some thoughts process of how to look at this coming market. I remember listening to Tucker all the time on this show and he'd say, Oh, I think the market's going to crash. I think we're gonna have some issues. And you know, he was right a little bit and he was wrong a little bit. You know, if we knew now what we knew, you know, if we knew now well, back in 2015, we would have bought a ton more rentals, right? Everybody, you can always hindsight's always 2020. So, but if you're in properties that you just can't ever see the value getting any higher, kind of like our 25 unit, I'm like, this is going to take two, three, four years before the value goes higher. Let's sell it. Let's take those chips and let's deploy them somewhere else where we can get a better return on equity and be in a little bit better asset. So that's kind of thought process today, guys. Sorry if I rambled. I just really wanted to talk about these things on the show. And one of my favorite things I used to listen to was Tucker. And when listening to him talk and his thoughts on the market. So please, if you have any feedback on, on my thoughts or you think uh, maybe I miss, I'm wrong in some areas or you just want to disagree, you have a different opinion, I'd love to hear it. You can reach out to me on Instagram at Elliot Smith REI. You can shoot me an email at Elliot Call Magic Leads. But I, I hope you understand that Right now, the most important thing you can do is finding good partners, you can keep liquidity, and you can also study the markets a lot. You need to be paying attention to what's going on and things that affect you. Mortgage interest rates affect you, affordability affects you, price for development and housing costs affects you. 
And so those are the things that you should be studying and understanding um, moving forward to make sure you're protected for the next three to five years. I feel like we're gonna have a really good three to five years in my opinion. We're very bullish as long as we're buying it below replacement costs or we're in it at a good equity price. I feel like people need housing and we will be okay. So hope you guys enjoyed this episode and I'll catch you on the next one.